Hello, hello, happy Thursday. I am Kathy McPhillips. I work in the marketing department at Content Marketing Institute, and this is our Thursday conversation. So we've been doing this for a while, and every Thursday we are gathering with some of our speakers from Content Marketing World 2020 to talk about the track that they spoke in. Um, this is a way for you as the attendees to watch the sessions in small chunks. I watched this these weeks. I was telling Mo this morning. I watched this week's session while on my bike riding. I watched this. I breezed through the sessions and I breezed through my ride. It was actually fabulous. I highly recommend that. Um, it's a great way just to stay on top of everything as these sessions do go away at the end of April. So, this week we are talking about teams and workflow and processes. And I have Anne Ginn with us. Anne is a CMI contributor. She's been actually been with CMI since almost the very beginning. She. Uh, edits our magazine, she edits our blog, she can do everything, she's amazing. And then we also have Andrea Freyrier from Agile Sherpas, and many of you might know Andrea from Content Marketing World, she's spoken at Content Tech Summit, and she's who we go to for all things Agile. So ladies, thank you so much for being here. Thanks for having us. Yeah. So, um, Anne, I've known you for most of my life, I've known <laughs> Anne since kindergarten. Uh, we went to all our schools, even college together. And Anne is known as Editor Anne. Anne can take anything and make it sound so much better. Whenever I write a blog post for CMI, I send it to Anne and I, she sends it back and I'm like, wow, I sound really smart. You are really good at this. So she's been just amazing to work with. And if you haven't watched her writing session, I highly recommend you go back and watch that one too. So I'm just going to jump in and ask a few questions. I love just your, your yeah. thoughts. And um, if you want to expand on anything, I know 30 minutes of content marketing world went super fast. I know they're usually a little bit longer. But so if you want to talk about anything else, feel free. So one thing I noticed um, in your session, Anne, was that 90% of content marketing teams have less than five people. And 50% have one or zero. I feel sorry for the, the team with zero. I mean, someone's doing it in like this much of their job. Um, is there like a right, I mean, I know it, that it always is, it depends, but is there a right size a percentage of a de department that you really think is a good amount? That's a good question. And I don't know if there's a right size, like you said, depends is our favorite, favorite word in that respect. Um, but I think, the idea more so than the size of the staff. I mean, I think certainly at one to two full-time people, depending on the size of the company, but it relates to the output. And I think that's the struggle that content marketing teams have, even if you're one or a half a person or five people is understanding what's the reasonable output that that team size can generate and, and equating the two as opposed to starting with the count of the team. Now, you, if you can get more budget for more team members, that's great. Um, but being realistic with what you expect that small team to do or or however many resources, right? Even if you have a team of 20, it makes sense to figure out what's what's expected from that group and, and make it realistic as opposed to, we'll write a hundred blog posts in a month and do all this other stuff that's required. My gosh, one of my friends took a job and she said that she, she was interviewing for a job, she ended up not taking it, but they said part of her job was she was managing 80 different blogs as one person, I was like, I don't even know how, how you would even start doing that. So she politely declined that job. But do you think that there are people that say they're doing, they're part of a content team that really aren't doing content as we would define content marketing? Yeah, I think that's part of also the other part of it, right? And the numbers are, if it's not called a content marketing team, do you consider yourselves like part of the marketing team? The marketing team is 20 people, but the people doing content are two people, you know, and I think that's where job crossover and this is where content marketing, because it's not a dedicated profession as such. And people come into it from, from all sorts of avenues and they're trying to figure out where to go with it, even within the company. I think that's the challenge of you've got, it's not organically created, right? It is organically created. There isn't a structure to hire in. And so people don't know what to do with them and anything that's related to content if it's writing, and I always joke, everybody can write, which is true because every job requires some kind of writing, but, oh, so you're the writer. So then we'll send you this direct sales copy or whatever. Um, and I think that's where the lines blur between content and content marketing. Right. I actually just had a friend who is in, in Dallas. She's looking for an agency and she said, 
I said, what do you need? And she said, I'm looking for a content agency. And what she needs, I said, you need an agency, not a content agency. Or at least, you know, get an agency that can also help you with some content, but that you need an advertising agency. Right. You know, so, um, and a Andrea, just with kind of understanding terms, you know, some people say, I've got a blog, I'm doing content marketing, even if the blog is all, is all sales. Are there people that say that they're doing agile that aren't? Like, like I'm doing this little part of it. So we're, we're doing, we're agile. Oh yeah, it's it's a huge uh, misconception to say like, well, we sort of pivot a lot and we change our minds every week or so about what we're really focused on and what our goals are. So we're just going to say that we're agile and it kind of covers a, a multitude of sins, so to speak. But it's you can do those sorts of things out of necessity or by accident. But I like to say that you won't ever be really agile like the capital A version on accident. You have to do some hard work to make that happen. So what, you know, you talked a lot about the, um, you know, planning in advance, all the extra work and just other th the things you have to do to, to, to do that. What, um, what are some, some steps people should take in the very beginning? If they're, I mean, obviously they need to say, the whole team needs to say, all right, we are doing this together. Because you said that teams, you know, one person can't be agile, the whole team needs to be agile. What would be the first thing you would approach one of your clients and say, okay, here's, here's how you got to start. Yeah, it's it's really initially a lot about understanding where you're starting from. And so there's a lot of work on visualizing what you've got. So uh, the agile term is a backlog, but you can think of it as just a big to do list, like what's coming at you over the next two to three weeks for the whole team. Right. Get it all out there and then have someone who can apply a strategic perspective to prioritize it which I loved what, what Anne was saying about don't expect people to do way too much because as soon as you start to see the full scope of everything, you can start to say, oh, wow, we have really unrealistic expectations about what people can actually accomplish in a short amount of time. And then that initial round of visualization is the first step toward being able to say, here's a small amount of really important, valuable work that we're going to agree to focus on as a team and now you're into that mode of executing as a unit and really focusing on what's going to make a difference for your core KPIs, as opposed to just living on that hamster wheel of doing stuff that you've always done because it's the stuff that we always do. Well, I mean, and that kind of goes to what Anne was saying and hers with the documented content marketing strategy. You know, if you need to write it all out, write it all out. But no one wants to see this big thud factor, you know, this big book of all this stuff, you know, if you need to get it all out and then figure out what's the most important things, what are the most actionable things that you can be doing right now? Yeah. Um, all right. So, you know, speaking of that thud factor and, you know, I love seeing the data. I love seeing the reports. I love getting my hands dirty and getting really into that, but I know that Stephanie doesn't, you know, I know that Aaron doesn't. So I think it's really important. Like, do you, when you work with your clients, do you flush everything out, you know, and then whittle it down to a one pager, you know, a double sided one pager that you mentioned? Yeah. Yeah. And that's, in fact, I was just finishing up with one client the other day and we were talking about things and I'm like, oh, I have some information on that. We were kind of walking through it, but I said, but I didn't include it in there. I'll look up the specific data to your question because they weren't going to read it. And in fact, I had written a lengthier report. Um, they weren't ready for the one to two page yet. And I'd written it. And then we talked about uh, how to condense it because we were going to share it with the executives, with his uh, supervisors. So, and that was easy to do because it was written in a way that could condense, was intended to condense to one or two pages. So I think that just because it's sh short and people will read it, kind of like you, Kathy, like to look at the data, it's available if somebody wants to dig into it, but it's not required reading. And I think that's the difference of making it required to figure it out or for you to do it yourself. And I often say when I was in journalism and even now, do the math, don't make people do the math when you're writing content about percentages or anything else. And I think the same is true with content marketing. Do the work, don't make other people do the work. If, if that's your job is to do the work and, and lead to the strategy, don't make them do all the math and analyzing to come to the same, to conclusions. I like that. I like doing the math, though. That's what. Yeah, that's that's yeah. when we split when we were in school together. You went the writing route. I went the math route. So yeah, I like I like getting into all that. 
So these topics are really hard to pivot back and forth and kind of, you know, segue into a good question for each other because Agile and, and uh, what, you know, the documented strategy are so different. So pardon my horrible segues going from one of you, from one of you to the next. But uh, Andrea, I know there are a lot of tools out there from an Agile standpoint people could, could use, you know, um, sometimes people might think like, oh, I'm going to get this and that's going to fix some things. What do you, what comes first? I mean, the strategy needs to come first and the team needs to be on board, but how much, how many problems does a, to the technology fix? Like, <laughs> Yeah. I mean, we get questions about tools all the time and the answer was a little bit different a year or 18 months ago because I would always recommend that people started with an analog solution. So get a whiteboard and sticky notes and like mess around for a little while and realize what you need and what types of information are useful for your team as well as your stakeholders and executives to have access to. And then you're going to know you're going to be a better buyer, right? Of the of the tool that will enable you to to get a little more sophisticated, a little more analytics, all of that good stuff. <laughs> now that whiteboards and sticky notes are not a super feasible first step for most of us. Um, I would say to start with something that's as close to that as you can get. And there's quite a lot of lightweight things that are easy. There's a really low barrier to entry like Trello. I'm a longtime Trello fangirl. I still use it for my personal Kanban board. Um, Miro and Mural have become, I think, a lot of people's go-to whiteboard replacements over the last year, year and a half. Um, and so those are super straightforward and like get it out there and, and get your digital hands dirty and mess around with it. Then you're going to know, you know, we really need our cards to be able to do this, or it's really important for us to break things down into horizontal swim lanes. And there's some more traditional project management tools that just don't have that capability. Um, and so if you need that, then you're going to be looking for more of an agile tool than a project management tool, but you won't know that until you have an opportunity to like kick the tires of agile for your team for, I would say at least a couple months. Okay. Are there, are there certain technologies that integrate with other technologies that we might use more often, like our marketing automation or our CRM or anything like that, that is a useful connection? Yeah. I mean, that's definitely should be part of kind of the buying process, I would say of you know, the less duplicate entries you have, the more likely people are to adopt. So if they have to update their content strategy in one place and then try to put that into a backlog of, you know, activities for the agile execution, they're going to pick probably one or the other. So if you can have a way for them to talk and um, another thing I love are to streamline the intake process too, right? So if people need something from the team, all they have to do is fill out this form on this page and boom, it goes into our system or send an email to this one email address and it goes into the system. Um, Cause that again, will help you with adoption outside the team and help you kind of free up from all the stuff that kind of comes flying in from all directions and muddies everything up because I was supposed to be working on this thing, but now somebody's hair is on fire over here and I have to go yeah. deal with that. And, and, if it only comes from one place, then you at least know you haven't missed anything and the stuff that's being prioritized, you have all the information. So, Anne, you use Trello with CCO, you know, just because Andrew is a pro at it, you know, you're, and you're a user, you might be a, user, a pro user, but do you have any, what did you like about it? I, well, it's helpful to see the whole process outlined um, in that and understanding the stages. And so that's was the helpful thing for Trello. And my role in it was very small on, on the CCO part of it, but um, I could look at it and see where things were in the status report without having to ask. I could see if I thought the deadline was gonna fluctuate of when something was gonna come to me um, based on where I could see it was in the process, despite, you know, we, we get calendars and production calendars and those are necessary and important, but sometimes we get off the actual calendar. And instead of having to notify everybody who's not involved at the moment, hey, we're gonna be late or this kind of stuff, it was just easy to have that one spot uh, to go to and to find all the files. So I knew I was working in the correct version. Connecting all that was was huge because I've been there before where I've edited the wrong or looked at the wrong thing and did the whole work and then found out that that was the wrong file. 
Yeah, I love what you said there, Anne, about, you know, people can stay up to date without having to go and solicit information from someone, right? It saves you from the never ending stream of Slack messages or emails or status meetings or these kinds of things. And so if you do it well, then a good visualization system allows people to feel up to date and informed without gumming up their time on these other, you know, less value added activities. Yeah. Or flooding their inboxes with updates that you're like, I don't even know if I don't, do I care about this yet? I don't care. I don't think I care. Do I need to read it? Yeah. Yeah. And you know, our team is using, we're using Microsoft Teams and there are some people using Trello for different things, but you know, we're in a bunch of different systems, you know, whether it's Google docs or OneDrive or, or different play or Dropbox. And I actually yesterday took a file and I deleted it all. I thought I downloaded it. I deleted all the tabs I didn't need, but I deleted all the tabs from the original file. And then I went to hit save and I was like, oh my gosh, thankfully there are backups in, you know, in OneDrive. Um, totally off topic, but okay. So, and one of the things you talked about is um, learning how to atomize your content and just planning for all of that in advance. You know, a lot of the things that CMI is doing, for example, is we're doing them by popular demand posts where we're resurfacing posts that are evergreen that just need a little bit of tweaking and updating and rerunning that um, crowdsourcing posts and then repurposing other other content and you said it's really important to take all the things kind of make that laundry list of things you need before you have published just so you can go back to someone not have to go back to someone and say you know that great quote you gave me could you videotape it now um, right. and what are some tips you have as far as i mean maybe getting you know getting in um yeah, Joel, you know, maybe if you had an agile system, all that would be in there already and you could just have your checklist. Do you have any advice on how you approach that or what type of um, system you use to have that checklist? Yeah, and you're right. It goes back to what Andrea was saying about having starting with the sticky notes everywhere and trying to figure out your what the priorities are and things like that. So um, I think it. Oh. So it doesn't matter. I'm still here. So it's as simple as having a template that when you go into it, you know what you need. So every time we do a blog post, I know what I need for the newsletter. I know what I need for the SEO description. And the same is true for how else could this content be used? So if we're thinking video, let's just, you know, make even ask as you write the piece, I'm using a blog post as an example, but it could be anything. As you start out planning for it, in addition to asking what's the purpose of it, is how it's gonna be distributed and how many ways do we want to distribute it? And don't just limit it to, yep, this is a blog article from that, but is this going to turn into a video? And again, just create a simple little checklist and, and you'll get used to it that you don't even need to look at it. Um, but by deliberately thinking in advance of everything you do, then that makes it much more easier to, to wrap up and finish up and not have to repeat steps as you take it down a different path. And I feel like we're saying such obvious things, like, of course, you'd want that checklist before you start doing all this. So you could just do things one time while things are fresh in your head. But I don't know why, but not everyone does. And, you know, just having these systems and Andrea, I'm sure you could speak to that. Like, where does that fit in the process? And how do you have all these team members involved working off of the same file and having and knowing their part of that process? Yeah, I mean, I I know we were saying, like, maybe where, where are the intersection points between what Ann and I are talking about? But I'm seeing a lot now, right? Because we we advocate for the same thing uh, in a digital board. Like every time you do a certain kind of task or a certain kind of project, just copy the last digital card, we're assuming digital now, copy it and then use it again. So you don't have to keep remaking the same cards over and over again. Again, we're getting making it easier and lowering the barrier to entry for people to put everything into the system. But then, yeah, if, if Anne's got her, you know, content production checklist on her digital card and then maybe i'm responsible for getting that incorporated into our email delivery system right then i've got a card in the backlog that reflects those activities that i'm responsible for and if we've got it set up nicely then Anne can tag me on her card and tell me she's finished with her pieces and now it's ready for being scheduled in distribution which triggers me to act on my card and so we can collaborate and then if, Kathy, you're our boss and you need to understand how all of that is going, all you have to do is come into our board and it's very clear, like, 
what she's done, what I've done, whether things are on track or not. And it, it really makes it a nice, more smoothly operating process, especially when you're in, we're all in this work from home mode and more and more, I think distribution is becoming more and more the norm for teams. And so if I'm online in the morning and you're online in the afternoon, now it's easy for us to feel that we are actually informed and up to date on what's happening with the team because we did a little extra work up front to visualize what's happening. And I even think, Kathy, going back to your question, and, and Andrea is right. As I listen to Andrea talk, I'm like, oh, yeah, I should be doing that because my mind does not work like hers as far as that goes. You know, you're very organized and this is what you do from that. And I think sometimes people are like intimidated by processes or they think it adds on. And I think that's where, I know that's kind of where my initial thing is like, oh, it's one more thing. And and it's taking that time, it's breaking my mentality, my, my mental thinking of, nope, I've got to take this. It's going to save me in the long run. And it's good for me, even if it doesn't feel comfortable to me um, in the beginning, which is kind of what Andrea was saying is all logical and all, but, but we're not always logical. Well, this is a great time of the year to start working on this type type of thing. You know, we're kicking off, you know, it's almost February, but there's a little long, long year ahead. And especially with everything going on, like you said, with everyone being home and, you know, going back and forth and just if everyone's on the same systems, if everyone's following the same organizational structure and their workflow is getting better, I mean, gosh, what an opportunity right now to do that. So I'm just going to um, wrap this up. I think that's great. I really wish people can watch their sessions because it really gives you a good framework for how you can organize your department, organize your team, organize yourself. You know, a lot of these things you could even just do with some of your own, your own projects. Um, anything you're working on, ladies, that you want to talk about and that anyone want to want to send them to a certain place to learn more about you or your company? Uh, yeah, we are kind of in nerd mode over at Agile Sherpas right now. We do a state of Agile marketing report every year and we're we just close the survey and the report will come out in March. So if people are interested in how marketers use Agile, what benefits they get, like what practices are most common, uh, if you jump over to agilesherpas.com and sign up for our email list, you will be among the first to know. Awesome. And you can find me um, at Content Marketing Institute or geforcecommunication.com. If you scroll down to the bottom of the page, uh, I do free 30 minute pro bono consultations uh, at once a week or so. So you can sign up for there if you have a more specific questions and kind of want to dig in. But in the meantime, I'll be looking forward to the State of Agile report coming forward. Mm -hmm. And I was on your website yesterday. I sent someone your way. So uh, it's the shoemaker's <laughs> kids. <laughs> It's all good. Thanks. Um, thank you both so much. This was fun. So next week we have another Thursday conversation and I'm going to not going to lie. I forget what it is, but we will be here next week. No, we're talking about social media. We our social media month starts. We've got a, uh, we're going to have a great, um, some blog content. We've got some great Twitter, Twitter chat guests on social media this month. We're focusing a lot on social on our Thursday conversations. So we will see you next Thursday at one. So thank you both so much and have a good rest of your week. Thanks.